Thanks. Next up, we have Elena Williams. She is a fellow Canberra local, involved with numerous and lovely community organizations in Python and related uh, communities. And we'll be talking about Python graph, di graph databases and how they will change your freaking life. <laughs> Take it away, Elena. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, so this talk is called Graph Database to Change Your uh, Freaking Life. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to Pike Online 2020. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, all the organisers, the AV team. Uh, they're absolute magician. Thank you so much. So um, uh, this talk, I'm Elena, and uh, I'm proudly one of the Canberra Python organizers and we have a really awesome team and we have our Oktoberfest coming up really soon so come sign up to that. Um, and the reason I'm giving this talk is a couple of years ago I saw this talk by Ed Finkler, he's known as Funkatron on the internet and it was hilarious and it like really spoke to me and since then I've spent more than a year working really intensely on a large graph database pro project that I'm really focused on. And with his permission, this talk was inspired by that talk, but it's, you know, a bit different because Python and his drawl incomparable. Um, so the goal of this next 20 odd minutes is to encourage you to feel like you're in a place where you'd feel good about having a go with playing with graph databases. And um, yes, that is an actual visualization of the Paradise Papers database. So I'm assuming that you're familiar with conventional database technology but are brand new to graphs. That's the point of view of this talk. So we're going to go over the fundamentals of graphs. We're going to look at the relative shortcomings of other graph database types, or other, other database types, non-graph database types. I'm going to talk about how graph databases are different and particularly what they're good at. And then we're going to try out some code. It hasn't been technically perfect. If we have to bail on that, we have to bail on it. Cool. And I really miss seeing everyone live. Most craft talks, a lot of craft talks, start with Euler's Seven Bridges of Konigsberg, a historically notable problem in mathematics, which laid the foundations of graph theory, prefigured the idea of topology. And uh, to brazenly steal Ed's joke from the original talk, I think I mentioned I was a, a web developer earlier, and um, it was my understanding that there would be no maths. So all you need to know is that graphs are, to, are comprised of two types of elements, nodes and relationships, the round things and the connectory bits. That's all you need to know. So congratulations. You are looking at a graph database knowledge graph. So to have integrity, you got to have a node on either end, like a half to touch relationship don't make any sense. And the, the ha the direction, you have to have a direction, but it's it's not really that important unless you've got a highly optimised environment and obviously you want the direction to make sense. Um, and nodes, on the other hand, can have as many relationships as they like and nodes, them, they can relate to themselves if they want to. So this is a slightly more complex graph. So hopefully it's completely evident what's going on here. Um, and, you know, this doesn't map too badly to a relational database. Um, you know, maybe we'd expect the blue nodes to be in a person table, green node be like a language. Um, this kind of categorization here is not tables, it's called labeling in a graph. And it's actually totally arbitrary. So you can have multiple labels on a node, you could give them all different labels. Um, you don't even have to have labels. Like if you want a giant hum homogenous ball of data, no one is going to stop you. So all the relationships, on the other hand, can have one and only one kind of label. That's really fundamental to the architecture. This is language and created here. Um, so what there are a few things that call themselves graph databases in this world, but um, the ones we're talking about here are the ones that are most similar to relational databases because they have persistent storage. So the talk graphs I'm talking about are called label property graphs. And that we've talked about the labels, but they have properties as well, which are key pair properties on the nodes and also on the relationships. And, you know, this is kind of looking a little bit like a Django model and I can wrap my head around that. But then things start to get strange because, like I said, you can have multiple labels on a node and that makes no sense at all in a relational database context. But otherwise, 
nodes and relationships are labels and properties. They're the building blocks of graph database architecture. It's all you really know, need to know. But because of these rules, everything is related. And what you can get from that is very long arbitrary graph traversals, which are cheap. And this is the real strength and point of differentiation of graph databases over relational databases, that graph databases are vastly superior at managing related data, related data. And so here's where the language in the database ecosystem sort of starts to let us down. So let's talk about it. Relational databases, relational relational that word you keep using that word so let's ask the question are relational databases good with relationships and it probably depends on your definition of complex and you know managing multi-dimensional data is probably you know painful uh by pretty much it, if you ask anyone who's ever done it um traversing joins is rubbish and according to the laws of computers it's like slow particularly if you have uh, many data and you know as anyone who's accidentally broken their pks will know relationships only exist because of happy coincidence it's effectively a kludge and you know with all of the gratitude in my soul to Zeke and Andy Godwin and all the other quiet heroes of migrations who probably understand more profoundly than pretty much anyone else, it's really messed up to modify schemas and um, particularly keep your relationships straight when you do so. So let's talk about no SQL databases because, you know, when I'm talking about SQL and no SQL, all of the NoSQLs are the same, really. So here are some NoSQL families, and obviously I'm not talking about graph databases, which are also considered NoSQL, for the purpose of asking the question, are NoSQL databases good with relationships? And, you know, relation, if NoSQL databases were never meant for complex models, and, you know, scaling joins sucks even harder than with relational databases and i'm speaking specifically to everyone out there who has ever spent any of their precious precious life having to work with kludgy precarious joins in no sql relationships that it's actually uh, no sql database actually not very easy and um of course modern labeled property graphs have asset transactions so um there are things that graphs do not do well, and the answer is like simply like ledgers and tables. So graphs have traded off the ability to work efficiently with a record's properties. So if you want to get like an average, you want to get all the heights and you want to compare them to each other, they've traded off the ability to do that well to instead be able to do fast, complex traversals over the data, data database. And so how is this trade-off good? Well, we live in an area where we don't count our data in rows. We weigh it in terra and petabytes. And it's expensive and hard to get insights from data when it comes by the boatload. So graph databases give you a tool that's optimised specifically to get cool insights from very large corpora. Don't come at me about the plurals. We've already had that conversation today and it's going to get a lot worse. So so, um, so long as you know how to ask really good questions, this is an excellent tool for that. So let me give you an example. So you get an email requesting a customer report and um, there's a research called uh, Nicholas Christakis, who's a physician and sociologist at Yale, who over the years has introduced some very interesting ideas about spheres of influences over your social network. So maybe someone in your organisation's read about that and they've requested an email for everyone who bought a widget. Sure, who bought a widget from yesterday's email? No worries. Lives in Canberra. Fine. He's into books. Okay, good. Oh, no, wait. Where is, where is this? Where, no, no, no. Yeah. You've got a big database. Whatever happens, you are about to have a very annoying day because you, my friend, are in SQL join hell. And what you need is many, many indexes, indices, plurals, don't know me. Um, and if you haven't set up your indices right, 
you're going to have to. And if you have many data, your lookups are going to take a while. And what you need is really big, long traversals for cheap. And because you have what we call index-free adjacency, because graphs use adjacency, matrices, not matrices, not indices, you are not in SQL join hell. And that pre-creek query cringe you get when you suspect it might be a really bad query it's just not there and you can do literally millions of hops per second and you require much much less computing resources but don't take my word for it ask this guy who said they got thousands of times faster in orders of magnitude less code with functionality that was previously impossible and he's talking about part of ebay's distribution network in asia um, but ebay also have uh, a knowledge graph to power their conversational commerce whatever that might be. Um, and there are testimonials like this all over. So let's dig into the specifics of why. So this is probably the most basic relationship drawn query money can buy, but don't try and pass that. It's not even worth your effort. Um, this is a gra graphical representation of the same with our drawing table. And so let's strip away all of the irrelevant craft and just focus, get rid of that drawing table and focus just on the relationships. Now look at the query for this. So congratulations, you are looking at a graph query. Um, this is in a query language called Cypher. There's another popular query language, open source query language called Gremlin. There's currently a standardization process going on right now and hopefully that it will soon be called GQL to go side by side with SQL. Um, and Cypher's being developed by Nero for j and I'm really grateful to them because they've let me, you know, steal all their examples. Um, you can do whatever you want. Um, but this query is obviously match person who works at the department and return their name. You can also use a where statement like this in case you want to go wild with your queries later. Um, let's put those two side by side. Now, one of these is certainly a lot easier on the brain than the other. And so let's just, uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to remind all my Django nautical friends that those, you know, beautiful, careful, hardworking people have made it much easier for us, but it just conceals, you know, more crafty, kludgy, yeah. So <laughs> let's take a moment to admire how simple that query is and, you know, what you get back from it. Um, and, of course, you get the flexibility to add properties on the fly. I mean, you can use a Python OGM, it's like an ORM, but an O. GM, if you want, you don't have to, and then you have all the freedom, and you can just, you know, proliferate <laughs> properties like crazy. That actually gets wilder than this because this is the equivalent of moving the Alice record to a, like a different table, but keeping the relationships and the properties. And you can have multiple labels, which is a, the equivalent of existing in multiple tables simultaneously, which is possible that's it's wild and ultimately you can have just nothing and do like whatever and you know when we're talking about patterns um the things that graphs do do well and anywhere where things are interacting with each other and you're doing lots of queries graphs are suitable for obviously they're not suitable for everything but if you want to look, analyze behavior and you want to like, analyze patterns of behavior this is the optimized tool. You, if you want complex insights, if you want flexibility, what we call unbounded hierarchies, uh, anywhere you know that there, the connections are more important than the entities. So domains where um, obviously there are patterns like looking for fraud, predictive maintenance in networks, um, uh, recommendations and customer segmentation, uh, and often at this early stage in the evolution of, of this technology, graphs are being used as feature layers on top of other processes and data's piped in and then you can solve a particular problem. Um, but like with all data, it's good to clearly know what you are looking for. So there's a sort of general spectrum of simple to extremely advanced use cases. And depending on your expertise and domain knowledge, you might immediately find some of these things in the top right obvious, even though you know they're at the top end. Um, but let's look at some of these. So Cisco currently uses a graph database as a master for master data management, their single source of truth, um, like many, many banks and uh, firms, retail firms and investment firms use um, uh, graph databases for fraud detection, uh, because finding relationships between entities, uh, finding fraud rings, and because the tr 
you can query the graph very quickly. You can have a real-time scenario for fraud detection. Um, you can use it for networking operations. So you can map dependencies of a system so you can find out what's going wrong and what the root cause might be for power reading. Power Grid HP uses graph databases for this. Um, and IAM, like this is an obvious use case for, you know, um, unbounded hierarchies with users and groups. Um, and science, so much science, um, particularly when you're starting doing advanced uh, machine learning stuff. But at NASA, someone made a graph database from for their Orion project. And to quote them, they saved two years of work and over $1 million of taxpayer funds. And um, they have a knowledge graph that they call lessons learned for space missions, apparently, which is uh, pretty cool. So there are lots of graph databases going at the moment. Um, these are a lot of more mature open source graph databases. And there are a lot of proprietary ones too. And it's, you know, it's only been like 10 years. So the moment of truth, let's get into some code. Enough talking about it, let's get into it. Um, so let's make a recommendations engine. And when you install Neo4j, um, you immediately get this uh, local browser that runs. So let's click on this and see how we go. Please do something. Ah, yay. So when you first time you log on, this is what you get. And you get this connection status with some credentials, which is we need to remember because we're going to use those later. We've got this tutorial and introduction. Um, okay, but we don't need all of that. And I am actually for safety going to just go to some examples I prepared earlier. So. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to create our first demo slide. It's just adding some data to our database. We're creating Guido, um, we're creating Python, and then we're connecting them together. Then we get, da-da, great, looks like a slide. And then we're going to make all of our frameworks and our people who invented those. So again, same thing, we're matching those, those nodes because they already exist and we're creating Flask, we're creating Django and go. And if I pull this over here like so, oh, look, it's a messy version of that then same slide. Okay, now let's create our buddies, Alice and Bob over there at the IT department. And this should be pretty straightforward. Create, 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 return. No worries. And there they are. And you know what? I can even make this bubbly one. And this is all just default stuff you get off the uh, bigger like it was. And, oh, yeah, there we go. The slides. And you now I'm going to set some arbitrary properties like I did in that other slide, just adding a bunch of arbitrary stuff here. For some reason this one kept breaking on me. So let's go. That go. Yes, that's going to work too. And look, what I did there, so Alice here is still a person, but she's also an all-round legend. Um, and Bob has all these properties, and we can see that in this table here, lots of their properties and stuff that we just added. There's a text version. Here's some Cody code. Um, and now let us do something new. We'll get rid of all those guys and let us like some frameworks. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to match all of the nodes that we already have in the system. Um, and I'm going to create bottle. I'm going to add another colleague for Alice and Bob, a colleague called Chris. And then we're going to define what they like. So Alice and Bob and Chris like bottle. Alice and Bob and Chris like Django. And Alice and Bob like Flask. But Chris doesn't. You know what? I reckon we could recommend to Chris that she likes. So we're going to like Flask. So we're going to create all of those. And let's see what frameworks our team likes. So here's a, a nice little match statement, which is everyone in the IT department who likes a fr Python framework. We're going to return the framework, we're going to return Python, we're going to order it for later. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we've got Alice, or Orion Legend, Bob, and we've got our frameworks here. And you'll see that Alice likes those three, Bob likes those three, but there is no connection for Chris. So let's go find this. So we are going to make a little match statement. But the thing is, is that recommendations only make sense from a point of view, if you think about it for two seconds. And so we need to add the parameter that is Chris. 
I'm going to add Chris as a parameter, um, which makes it easier to do programming later. And we are going to, for Chris, who is our person we just added, um, we're going to match what frameworks this not is doing a lot of work here that she doesn't like. And the answer should be Flask. Correct. Okay, now let's do it in Python. Let's go. So here we have uh, there's a Neo4j Python driver, which is the official driver, but there, which is pretty basic. But there's also a community drive Python driver called Python Neo, which is written by Nigel Smalls, who also writes the Python Neo, Python Neo, the Python driver for Neo4j. Um, and that's all that we need. That's all that I needed to install to get this farm. So let's go with that. Great. And hopefully my graph connection still works. Okay, nothing happened, so did it work? Ah, oh, look at looky that. Law looks pretty familiar. So we're returning all the nodes. I'm going to do our query, our match people person who works at, and then return their details. Great. We're going to write to return it as a table, which we can only do in Python. Um, and then we're going to use some of the built-in match functions that come as part of um, uh, Python Neo. So we've got uh, our person, all of our people. No, Matt, we're using our graph instance from up here. Yeah, graph instance from up here. We instantiated the graph, and then we're getting all the nodes, and they were matching all of the people things that are labeled person. Then we're going to match all of the nodes that have the name Alice. Great. We're going to match all the nodes where the node is. Or Randall, the label is around legend, and we only want the first one of those. And of course, it's our friend Alice again. And we're going to find everyone who works at this organization. Great. It's exactly what we would expect. And then let's do our match query. So we're matching all of the frameworks that everybody liked, all of the Python frameworks that everyone likes. So they're all of our frameworks, and they're all of our people. And then finally, where here is our big recommend statement with our match and our person and the frameworks. And this is from the point of view of Chris, from the parameter we put in. And because in our run statement, we can just add parameters. And of course, that can be optimized later. So the, the database will automatically optimize around parameters if you run the same query repeatedly. And the answer to this should be Flask. Correct. Yay. So let's just quickly just chuck this in a Flask. So here are our statements, and then we're just going to make a quick route. So let's make um, let's just see what we've got here. This is returning our statement of all of the frameworks that everyone likes. Let's make a recommendation for Alice. No, there are no recommendations for Alice. Bob, no, but Chris, we can recommend Flask. Terrific. All right. So, ah, <laughs> uh, let's get back to where we were. So there are so many more demos to play with. Um, I originally had a COVID demo and guess what? It died on Thursday. So these people had already managed, made this huge COVID database, 15 million records on it. That would have been really cool. We could have checked out some clinical trials, um, but we made our Flask app instead. Uh, there are heaps and heaps and heaps of graph demos that people have just put around the world. I strongly recommend, recommend playing with them. Um, and really, this technology is kind of new, you know, like um, it, it's much less mature than relational databases, which are like 40 years old. And depending on who you ask, graphs are like 10. You know, it's just a different technological paradigm um, and it's different from IDB. So the trick is to start small and know what quite try, kind of questions you're trying to answer and what kind of problems you want to solve. Like I'm pretty deep in the Kool-Aid of the graph databases, but the big graph database project I've been working on only has, has four components and only one of them is graph-based because it just isn't the right tool for the rest of it. And um, it's just a fundam ah, fundamentally different mindset. Um, so um, if there are all the tools are open source for the ones that I've been looking at, um, lots of work still needs to be done there and there are roadmaps and stuff like that. Um, but we do need better documentation. Like the beginner documentation is, isn't is great. Um, and the other thing too is that these communities are actually pretty good and I'm kind of selective and the communities are actually like 
nice and there are lots of people who look like me and I knew immediately that I love graph databases and I understand that they're not a good fit for everybody but they're good for solving problems you can't solve with existing tech and solving existing problems differently so I'm really looking forward to seeing um, lots of people in the Python community have fun playing with graphs because I sure as hell have a heap of fun playing with them so um yeah very good <laughs> i hope to see you around and thanks for everyone for coming to fight online it's so cool great thank you so much for your presentation elena that was really accessible for me to understand what value graph databases can add and how to think about them oh, new, for JC. new for j seems really friendly uh for beginners as well we've got some good questions in the chat for you to hang around and look at them and bend your list afterwards if you'd like uh, uh yeah up, for have, sure yes Next up, we have Indra Nilgosh with introducing the Lambda Calculus with Python. Thank you very much. Thank you. 